Hello and welcome, I'm Sonic Guru. I just want you to know that Blue Blood t-shirts as well as Sonic Guru t-shirts are available in the link below courtesy of Teespring. And yes, I will be wearing this for the rest of the episode. Thank you. When it comes to introducing new characters into a popular series, it's a 50-50 chance whether or not fans will take to them. On the one hand there's Wario, who not only got a successor series to the popular Super Mario Land games, Wario Land, but pioneered the Mega Micro Game series WarioWare. And on the other hand there's Raiden. While the intention was noble and very meta when you understand it clearly, he wasn't well received in Metal Gear Solid 2 as it was pulling the carpet from under those who wanted to play as Snake, and it took to being a cyborg ninja to be recognised as cool. I will admit, Revengers was a fun game. But Shadow the Hedgehog is in the latter category. First appearing in Sonic Adventure 2 as the Anti-Sonic, he is one of the most popular characters in the Sonic canon. So where else can you go other than give this edgelord his own game? Originally, he was intended to be a tragic character, as he was meant to die after sacrificing his life to save the planet. But his popularity was strong enough to bring him back from the dead and appear in Sonic Heroes, but with plot convenient amnesia and the question hovering over the player's heads if this even is the same shadow from the arc. Soon after a fan demand to give Sonic a gun... No, seriously, that happened. Sonic Team decided to give Shadow the main character spotlight and expand his confusing and tragic backstory in his own game, Shadow the Hedgehog. Where do I begin with this mess? Okay, so the story begins with Shadow lamenting over his forgotten past and what flashbacks he seems to recall but has no memory of. But before we can delve into that, the skies turn red, open up and aliens invade. Yeah, aliens. These are the Black Arms, and they have an identical colour scheme to Shadow. Its leader, Black Doom, approaches Shadow and says to bring the Seven Chaos Emeralds to him. Jumping to conclusions, Shadow thinks that since this unknown invader knows who he is, he rushes off to do exactly what he was just asked. And from this point on, things get a little bit confusing. You see, the game is designed to have branching paths, so depending on what hero, dark or neutral mission you complete, alters the story from then on. You choose who Shadow is and alter the arc of each story from level to level. He could be the world's destructor, its protector, the most powerful robot that Eggman ever created and so on. But these are just the endings of the game. Yes, endings, plural. Ten of them to be exact, and combine that with whatever path you can take from being all good then being all good to being bad at the end, changes the entire story of Shadow. In total, there are 326 separate stories to realise. So good luck completionist, you're gonna need it. The story, or stories, takes us more into Shadow's past regarding his time aboard the Ark, as well as his relation to the Black Arms. It makes the cipher in this game very difficult and very hard to explain because at any moment Shadow can be whoever the hell he wants to be. This includes who you choose to tag along with you. Enemies become friends, friends become enemies, and fight against or alongside Doom, Gun, Eggman, or the Sonic heroes. And because of the branching paths, it makes these jokes between story segments very jarring, as at one point you're in a city, then all of a sudden you're alongside Black Doom on floating ruins. That's not to say that it doesn't make sense. More than a handful of story arcs are actually cohesive and make sense within Shadow's personality and goals. The best path to take from the 300 plus mentioned if you want a more canonical version of events, is path number 153, together with Maria. And that path is neutral, neutral again, dark, hero, hero, and finally dark. It takes Shadow from gathering the emeralds to Prison Island and its connection to his past, flashing back to Maria, learning if he might be an android, confronting the commander, and finally defeating Eggman, but choosing not to kill him. It may not be subtle enough, but this game's story is dark, edgy, and meant to be taken seriously. Yeah, I know, it's hard to stifle a giggle at the concept, especially when guns are involved. GUNS! It's hard to concentrate on the very serious people talking about the very serious deaths that are happening during the very serious invasion when there's a cartoon hedgehog running around on hover skates packing heat. 
the biggest thing everyone latches onto in regards to this game is that it's a Sonic game with usable weaponry. We would like to see this again with swords, but at least then it was in theme, and Sonic as a Knight is pretty kick-ass. But here, we're playing as a Dark One, and firearms were heavily demanded in a once colourful platformer. While you still have your basic necessities from Sonic Heroes, running, jumping, home and attack, triangle jump, which has now been upgraded to allow you to run on walls for a few seconds, and spin dash, which is now mapped to the X button. For reference, I'm playing the GameCube version. The B button is now the fire button for whatever gun you automatically pick up or jab if you want to do a gunless run. Pressing Y drops it, and running over the same gun gives you more ammo than you would comfortably need. This includes swords and other bludgeoning instruments. Yes, swords have ammo. And with guns come strafing. Just hold down the R button to shimmy side to side. Not that you would need it, because I never did. A shadow just shoot at whatever's in his line of sight. The auto-targeting is finicky at times, as he will shoot what is supposed to be an ally for whatever mission you're doing, but otherwise it is useful when dealing with hordes. Except the rocket launchers. I can't hit shit with them, so maybe strafing is good for something. Another useful yet useless addition is vehicles. I say this because you really do not need them on both gameplay and principle. But some are outright required to even finish missions, such as the hover disc and the jump vehicle. Who the hell on the R&D team is naming these things? A lot of the special vehicles, as well as hidden stashes of more powerful weapons are locked behind doors that require five hidden keys throughout the stage. It's some level of replayability I guess, but the rewards for finding these elusive keys are not worth the effort. But to tie into the hero dark dichotomy is the chaos gauges. Taking out enemies of the hero or dark factions fills either gauge and filling it gives you invisibility as well as unlimited ammo. But hitting Y will initiate the hero's chaos control to fly through the stage for a while or dark's chaos blast to cause massive damage. I actually like this. Unlike the other games that try a moral choice system, which basically results in a good or bad ending, the moral choice is tied directly into the gameplay, as well as the game's design with branching paths. Speaking of... I've talked up the game's design of branching paths and missions, but here's how it works. Every stage has three completion quotas, or missions, except the highest and lowest stages, as well as the final stages that have two. Each of these missions vary in what's required. While most have the basic race to the end mission, others range from killing slash destroying a set number of enemies, finding things, activating things, or taking out a single bullet sponge target. Plus it is actually possible to fail these missions, forcing a level reset if you're going for a certain path. What makes a few of these missions a near impossibility is that some of the stages are open-ended. Yes, non-linear, backtracking, blink and you miss it, open-ended stages, and because of the gritty presentation, it's hard to tell whether or not you've been to a place before until another batch of soldiers or aliens show up. I hate them! No joke, it took me 38 minutes to beat Lost at Impact's hero mission. Besides dying a few times, I run around the freaking arc so many times its map is now burned into the back of my head, along with Maria's constant talkback, and where, oh where? Was the final two artificial chaos hiding? In a room in the corner that looks like every other freaking room I've been in as well as just hanging around in the open after a tram ride, I swear I've ridden at least five times before. Real Chaos knows how I missed that faker, but I finally did it, and I can say without a doubt, fuck that mission. And Central City can go to hell along with it. In an attempt to alleviate the backtracking because you will more than likely have missed some of the shootout on your first race through, each checkpoint can be used as a teleporter to other checkpoints throughout the stage, but only if you activated them and got the sweet bonus based on your ring count. The straightforward traditional stages continue the design's philosophy of heroes and that there's always something to find when you stop and look. Alcoves, alternate paths, maybe a goodie or two. But be prepared for trouble as the enemy spawns are bigger and more frequent ranging from standard goons, heavy artillery goons, big bulky goons, flying goons, gun mechs, worms, and sneaky goons who turn invisible. Not that they're a threat because they go down pretty easy, and don't worry about your ring count if you get hit. This, 2006, the storybook games and Forces' easy mode are the only mainline titles that don't take all your rings away from a single hit. I know 2006 is only when the gunners are using machine gun fire, but shut up, I'm making a point. Completing each mission gives you a rank from A to E. And yes, 
you are ranked for every mission. But even the results screen ties back into the Hero Dark system, where every choice on what you do and who you help is kept track of in the score. While being neutral gives you the overall score, completing a Hero or Dark mission will punish you by deducting your score if you gain points for the opposite. This will throw you around the bend if you're going for all A rank, because there are times you have to do an evil or noble act just to advance. From the dark story and edgy gameplay, we have gritty graphics. A lot of greys and muddy colours coat this game's visuals. Well, I tell a lie because there are a few stages that use the bright neons we're used to, specifically casinos and the Matrix. Don't ask. That's not to say that it's not hard to see where, who and what. This isn't some Snyder film lacking colour. Every character, item, enemy and path is distinct and don't blend into each other. It's just boring to look at for the most part. Even those that don't have a dark grey palette suffer from dull repetitiveness. Plus, would you guess that I showed you two different stages? No, I didn't think so. Speaking of dull, the black arms are laughably dull. Blackish humanoids with red tips and yellow eyes. I mentioned the various goons to shoot at, or ignore if you're working with them, but they're so forgettable. At least GUN and Eggman have various mechs including real shadow androids. Though the gun soldiers are all the freaking same too. Did Gun find a cloning machine on the Ark or something? Watch Dowers episode 2 and thought, that's a good idea. If it seems like I'm brushing off the visuals, it's because there's only so much you can extract from a game with desaturated textures, repeated stages, and green blooded cloned aliens. Music on the other hand? Wow. You want metal and grunge? This is metal and grunge. With a side of bounce and techno. West Stopless will certainly be your number one song to hum to afterwards, seeing how you will be playing it 10 times. Each track fits the level they're from and fit the mood, especially the dark catacombs of the Black Comet. But like with 2006 and Riders, the music only lasts as long as you're playing it. But that's nothing on the theme songs, five in total, from the main theme of I Am to the various end themes of Waking Up by Julian Kay and All Hell Shadow by Magnify, which would later be covered by Crush 40 in 2006. Totally kick-ass songs that reflect on what choice you made during the game. But now we have to talk about the elephant in the room, and that's the 4 kids voice cast replacement. Look, to be honest, back when this game was released in 2005, I did not notice the change in cast, other than Rouge and Eggman. When it was revealed to me that there was a complete cast change, I didn't care. I figured it was part of the course since most of the previous game's cast kept changing. Remember the various voice actors for Tales before Fall Kids came along? Yeah. But getting to the performance of the cast, it's weak. At the time I didn't care, but after many years and games featuring the Fall Kids cast, it really stands out as the weakest and wouldn't improve until Unleashed and Black Knight, which are sadly the final games before the change to the, at time of writing, current cast. Except Sean Chamello's Black Doom. Man, those are some deep vocals. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the CGI cutscenes by Blur Studio. And they are awesome. This team really could make a whole movie if they wanted to. Oh, hey, what do you know? After playing every stage, defeating every boss, and seeing all 10 endings, unlocks the last story. Meaning whatever path you prefer and lines up of how you perceive Shadow is now rendered useless. The last story sees Shadow learn who and what he is, Doom's plot and the real purpose of the Eclipse canon. Also Super Shadow in his last but one appearance. And also like Sonic Heroes, getting every A rank, which means getting A for every mission for every stage, unlocks Expert Mode. Here you play through all 23 stages in succession in what's described as training from the supporting cast. And it is brutally difficult! Not because there are harder renditions of stages you've already played, but because every small problem I have with this game from the controls to the level design to the unrelenting swarms of goons you have to fight, there's a matter to a bigger problem where it just drains me and grinds me down to a point where I'm just forcing myself to try and finish this. And I still haven't! You can check up there to see how far I've gotten! Overall, Shadow the Hedgehog the game is an odd duck. Or odd hog in this case. The idea of making a character-focused spin-off was an inspiring idea. 
but the execution failed as everything we know about Sonic and its world was tipped on its side as we're shown a more mature side of what Sega can do with the series. And it just doesn't work. I'm not saying Sonic can't be dark or have mature themes, but this was a step too far. The story is confusing unless you have a flowchart. The gameplay is loose with dumb gameplay shoehorned in to meet fan demands, and the overall experience leaves you feeling bewildered and eventually drained from the task of playing for the game for the required 10 times just to see the real ending. This game, personally, was the start of the dark age of Sonic. Luckily, it only lasted 3 years. Now it's just a bit grey. I rate this game 5.5 out of 10. Thank you all so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified. And please hit the like button and rate 5 stars because that really helps up the channel. Plus, if you want to help the channel out further, you can over on Patreon for just a dollar a month. Thanks again everyone, and I'll see you all next time.